what I want to talk to you about is before you can achieve anything in life, you have to overcome your internal conflicts. Yeah. Here we go. You see, I got where I am because I'm one Michelle and help me to stand be an independent man. Because I'm standing on the shoulders of a giant. The shoulders of a giant, y'all. I'm thankful. And internal conflicts come from the fact that we have so many different influences in our lives. And so what we have to do is we have to become more intentional about the influences that we actually give the power to, because if we don't, then we got all these different mixed messages coming from all these different places, and, and it's like trying to drive a car in two directions at the same time, and you just can't do that, right? A car is designed to go in one direction at a time. Well, a human being is designed to go in one direction at a time. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, this one thing I do. And it doesn't mean you only do one thing, but it means you're not, you don't have a split focus and a split attention and a split intention. A lot of times people will ask me to do something, and I'll tell them no just because it conflicts with what I know my purpose is. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with it. It just doesn't add any energy to the direction of my intention. And so I have to say, no, I'm not going to do that. So in James, um, in James, a lot of people take this out of context. And I want to I give it, I'm going to read it to you first. Um, and then I want to give it to you in context. It says, um, in verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and it braideth not, and it shall be given him. Now, a lot of people think that's just saying, well, if you lack wisdom, general wisdom, that you should ask God. Well, that's true. If you lack general wisdom, you should ask God, right? Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? So, so understanding the greatest perspective that exists on earth is a, is a perspective that exists from heaven. Are y'all tracking so the greatest perspective that exists on earth is not a horizontal perspective, but it's a vertical perspective. And we have the ability, because we have the word of God, we have the ability to gain that perspective while we're on the earth. And if I have a perspective that's from up here and everybody else's perspective is down here, that gives me an advantage because I can see more of the floor. Does that make sense? And so uh, that verse is not just talking about general wisdom, even though I think it applies to general wisdom. That's not specifically what it's talking about in the context. So I want to I make sure that y'all understand I'm not taking the scripture out of context, right? The context that it's talking about is the wisdom to go through trials joyfully. That's the wisdom that this verse is talking about we should be asking God for. The wisdom to go through trials um, joyfully. Because it says in, in James 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which were scattered abroad, greet him. Why were they scattered abroad? They were scattered abroad because they were being persecuted by the Romans. Okay? He said, but he said, count it all joy. And we, uh, I've covered this before, so I'm not going to go into great detail. Count is a perspective word. It means assign this meaning. When you look at this, you assign a meaning to this that will bring you joy doesn't mean you love trials. I don't love trials. Anybody here love trials? You love it when your car breaks down in the middle of the night in the rain and there's no one around to help? No, nobody likes that. You like it when the doctor says, well, I've got bad news for you. You got this disease, blah, blah, blah. No. You like it when the boss says you're fired or you're, if you own a business and your biggest contract says we don't want to do business with you. Nobody likes that, but we can still count that as joy. And it says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. I want you to notice there's not a, set, there's not a period at the end of that phrase, there's a semicolon or a colon. I don't have my glasses on. I think it's a semicolon. Um, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now there's a period. So what does that mean? That means knowing this, knowing is a perception word. Counting is a perspective word. Knowing is a perception word. So counting means this is what you assign the meaning to be, but knowing means you can only, you can only count you can only define this thing as meaning this if you know what you need to know. So you can only count like you're supposed to count when you know what you're supposed to know. Your, perception, your perspective can only be right when your perception is right. If your perception is off, your perspective is going to be off. 
And we live in a world, we live in a world of people whose perspectives are off because their perceptions are off. They don't know what they need to know, so they can't count how they're supposed to count. Count it all joy. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith work with patience. What does that mean? The reason I can count it joy when I go through a trial, regardless of what the trial is, the reason I can gain joy through that trial is because I know that God is getting me ready for something that he already has ready for me. Right? So God is using the trial to make me stronger than I am right now so that when I get where I'm going, I can stay longer than I would have if I had not gone through this trial. Are y'all tracking? Okay, so it says, but it says, knowing this is the trying of your faith, work with patience. And then it says, but let patience, by the way, the word patience means persistent, consistent endurance. You don't need persistence if the trial is not long. I mean, if the trial is not hard, you don't need persistence. The only reason we need to, pers to persist in something is because it's hard. Nobody needs to tell you to persist, just keep on eating the ice cream. Nobody needs to tell you to do that. But if you're working out, somebody has to tell you to persist. Right, right. If you're doing something good, it requires extra intention. And so, he says, uh, uh, if you're building a business, it requires extra intention. It's easy to want to quit. Like all of us have. I think there's somebody. At the, there's somebody at the door, y'all. Uh, no, that's Rob. That's Rob. I think it's Rob. It's, we're all good. So, so, so persistence, persistent, consistent endurance. We need persistence because this trial that we're in, this this challenging experience that we're going through is hard but consistent we need consistency because it's long so we need persistence that lasts for a long time anybody can have high energy in the first quarter but it's the team that has the high energy in the fourth quarter that wins the game right don't run out of gas in the last quarter don't run out of gas when you're almost across the finish line right so so he's saying count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations Knowing this is trying your faith, work with patience. Then it says, but let patience have her perfect work. What does that mean? It means let the trial do what God ordained for the trial to do when he ordained that you go through the trial. Dear God, please get me out of this trial. God's like, I just put you in that trial. What are you talking about? Get you out. I just put you in there. I mean, God doesn't have that voice, I'm sure. But, but anyway, <laughs> but <laughs> y'all get what I'm saying, right? Like, like I just, the, 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 this trial that you were in, this difficult thing that you're in, I put you in it so it can work on you. Or if God didn't put you in it, because sometimes the enemy puts you in it, right? But the enemy can't put you in it without God ordaining that he put you in it. That's why Joseph was able to say to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God meant your evil for my good. What? Let's go. So, so he says, let patience have her perfect work. Why? That you may be perfect. That means mature and entire. That means complete, la wanting nothing, lacking nothing. And then he says, but if any of you lack wisdom, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. In other words, if you lack the wisdom, the applied knowledge to do what I just told you to do, ask God for it. You don't know how to, have, if you don't have the wisdom to go through the trial and last through the trial and count it all joy while you're in the trial, ask God for wisdom. Okay, so that's the context. That's the interpretation. But with, with scripture, we have to understand that the scripture is infinite. One of the reasons it's infinite is because there is one interpretation. There's no scripture of any, is of any private interpretation. The Bible means what it says, and it says what it means. And I love what my daughter always says. It can never say what it's never said. It can never mean what's never meant, right? And so when it says, um, <laughs> if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, it's telling us that that's what we should do. And then it says, um, who giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. In other words, when you ask God for wisdom for the thing that you are dealing with, he's not going to chide with you. He's not going to say, what are you, you're, you, you were here asking for wisdom yesterday. Get out of my face. God's not going to say that, right? Um, so there's one interpretation, but there are many applications. The interpretation is when you're going through a trial, you don't know how to count it all joy, ask God for the wisdom to have joy in the trial. Ask God, for the, ask God for the wisdom to have patience while you're in the trial and ask him to give you the strength to let the trial do what the trial was ordained to do while you're in the trial. Don't just start begging to get out of the trial. 
Maybe he wants you in that furnace so he can show up and shine with you in that furnace so other people can see the God you say you serve instead of just hearing about it. How many of y'all picking up what I'm putting down? Wave at me, my people. Okay, so then it says, um, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Here's the, here's the part I want to get to. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. That's a tall order. This is not one of those prayers, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. This ain't that kind of prayer. Ask in faith, nothing wavering. Ask with the conviction that the answer has already been given. Ask knowing, it's, it's so interesting. If, if I see, especially by the way, you want some trials? You want, you want to stack up some trials? Start a business. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Right? Yeah, you want some trials? What? It's madness. Right? So, so let him ask in faith. I see new people get started in business. And the, the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems I see is they have too much doubt mixed with their faith. The word faith, by the way, in Scripture comes from the Greek word, in, in the New Testament comes from the Greek word pistis, which means a system. So faith is a system. What does that mean? What kind of system is that? Faith is a system. In fact, in, which is, let him, um, uh, he that waved, uh, blah, 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 where was I? But let him ask in faith. There it is again, pistis. And it says in the Strong's, moral conviction of a religious truth or truthfulness of God's religion uh, or a religious teacher, especially reliance upon salvation, abstractly consistent professing um, uh, profession by extension, the system of religious gospel truth itself, assurance, belief, faith, and fidelity. What is the system of faith? The system of faith is God is a God who put a restriction on himself. God put a limitation on a limitless God. What is the limitation God put on himself? He cannot lie. It is not that he will not lie. It is that he cannot lie. And there's a difference between will not lie and cannot lie. There's a difference between has not lied and cannot lie. There's a difference between does not lie and cannot lie. Cannot means cannot. And the reason God cannot lie is because the word for truth, God's word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Spirit of God is called the Spirit of Truth. John wrote to um, John wrote a, a letter um, to the church uh, and said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. See, we live in a world that is filled with error. Error. And we live in a world that's so filled with error <laughs> that now all of the evil forces that exist are fighting tooth and nail to silence truth. Do you understand that truth, truth never has to silence a lie. Why? Because a lie will eventually be made self-evident that it is a lie. The reason, the re, one of the reasons that chattel slavery lasted so long in the United States of America is because it was against the law to speak out against it. There was censorship against slavery. Now, I, like, it's, it's, it's interesting when they say the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history, right? But now we live in a world where like, the concept of free speech is only now a concept because you're not allowed to believe anything anymore. You're allowed to believe something until the consensus of the world system says you can't believe it anymore. Like, you look at the situation with Kyrie Irving, for instance, Kanye West. Um, they are being censored by mob. It, it, it's, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's, it's, it's like a business, it's like a societal modern day 
analogy to a lynching. Same thing. Same thing happened then. You weren't allowed to speak out against it, so now the mob can rule, right? And now you've got, like, Kanye West. I mean, not Kanye West. Kyrie Irving. I'm going to talk about his in particular because he spoke. He, he posted a link to an Amazon video in a tweet. And Nike cancels his contract. You know why? Because Phil Knight is a coward. That's why. And truth is not popular in a world of error. And, and you say, why do you say Phil Knight's a coward? He, he, he capitulated because he was afraid of all the noisemakers. It's, it's interesting. We think that the world believes all of this ridiculousness that's going on in the world because the people who don't believe it are silent. And the reason you're silent is because people are scared that they're going to get canceled. Well, you can cancel the trumpet, but you can't cancel the truth. As my dad would say, the truth is the light, and the light shines all over. And the reality is, they canceled, like, Nike canceled his contract. Um, the B Brooklyn, Net Brooklyn Nets, or whatever the name of that basketball team is, they suspended him for five games. This is so stupid. This is so cowardly. It's one of the weakest. We live in such a, a, an era of cowardice. And capitulation to loud noises. Anyway, I don't have any opinions about any of this stuff. If I did, I'd never voice them in public. But whenever, whenever, there's, whenever somebody is being silenced, I'm always suspicious of the people who are doing the silencing. I would recommend you do the same thing. Because the reality is, they don't really care that much about the content of the movie that, Con that uh, Kyrie Irving posted the link in. They wanted to silence the voice of somebody that a lot of people know who they are and a whole bunch of people could jump on the bandwagon. Because the reality, if they cared about that much about it, they'd be canceling Jeff Bezos. Real talk. Anyway, you say, Myron, what does that have to do with anything? Um, God is a God of truth. So faith, I don't have faith in faith. I have faith in the one who is faithful and he cannot lie. And I would recommend that you have faith in the one who is faithful and cannot lie. It's interesting to me that the world system wants to lump homosexuality, which the Bible calls an abomination. It doesn't even call it homosexuality. It calls it sodomy. Wouldn't it be interesting if you just called it sodomy? Instead of changing the language and making it homosexual and then making it gay, right? Sounds happy, right? Implying that people who are not homosexuals are miserable. That's the implication of changing language. Why? Because Satan is the master at changing language and changing the meaning of words. Say, Myron, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it has to do something with the fact that the ultimate objective is to end human life. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. Two men can't produce life, and neither can two women. Hmm. That's interesting. So the reason the enemy loves homosexuality so much is because it's anti-life. Why is it wrong? It's wrong because God says it's wrong. If it's not wrong for that reason, there is no reason. What does that mean? Well, here's what it means. If you have a son and a daughter and they say, hey, come to you and they say, mom and dad, we're moving in together. Okay, we'll go move in together. No, you don't understand. We're going to move in together. She's going to be my girl. He's going to be my No, we don't, you don't do that. Well, what's wrong with it? Well, you're, she, he's, she's your sister. She, he's your brother. But we're consenting adults. Right? If it's not wrong, if that's not wrong because God says it's wrong, then there is no reason. What's the difference? What's the difference? A man lying with an animal or a man lying with his sister or a woman lying with her brother. What's the difference? Why is it wrong? It's wrong because God says it's wrong. And if that's not the reason, there is no reason. You say, Myron, what, what are you talking about? I'm talking about... Faith is a system that's based on the one who is faithful. He cannot lie. And what you have to do as an entrepreneur is you have to understand that because God cannot lie, if he's got principles in the word that teach you how to run a business, if you apply those principles to your business, you don't have to wonder if they're going to work. 
my sense of certainty doesn't come from the fact that I'm smart. Um, sometimes I'm smart, sometimes not so much. My sense of certainty does not come from my experience because I've got experiences of things that have worked well and things that have just gone kaput. So where does my certainty come from? It comes from I, have, I know what's going to happen. Why? I have a book of precepts and principles and practices and promises and prayers and prophecies and patterns and parallels that give me the ability, it gives me the ability to make predictions about outcomes in the future so I can position myself on the path of prosperity. The word prosperity means flow. I can position myself in the, on the path of the flow by the t- so that by the time the blessings get there, I'm already there, buckets in hand. I'm not chasing a trend. Let patience have her perfect work, but that you may be tire, perfect and entire wanting nothing. But if, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. Faith without waver. Wow. It's interesting that the, it says without nothing wavering. <laughs> I don't know if y'all remember this story or not. I, I just, everything reminds me of something. So, Forgive me, I won't, cover, I won't share all of it, but do you remember the story in Mark chapter four? Jesus gets on the boat, he says, let us, let us pass over to the other side. He gets on the boat, falls asleep in the back of the boat, storm comes, and Jesus is not, he's conked out. He's so asleep, the ship is full of water, he's still, right, he's knocked out. The disciples, master, wake up, wake up, don't you care, we're about to perish? Perish, I said, let's go over to the other side, what y'all, what y'all worried about? See, here's what we need to understand. We need to understand that Yeshua is calm and comfortable in the midst of the storm. And if, if I'm more aware of his presence and his peace in the storm, the ship, the, water being, the ship being in the water, the water being in the ship is all the same thing to me. It can't do anything unless he lets it do it, unless he's already ordained for it to do it. Anyway, here's what it says. Jesus rebuked the wind Go read it in Mark chapter 4. But he said unto the sea, peace be still. I want you to notice Jesus rebuked the wind, but he just spoke to the sea. Bless you. Why did, why did he rebuke the wind and speak to the sea? Why did he rebuke the wind and the sea? Well, because the wind is a picture of false doctrine, and false doctrine always has to be rebuked. The waves are a picture of false doubt. Christ does not rebuke us for doubt. He just speaks to our doubts. And when we apply the word of God to our doubts, we know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. And so I don't have, like, I don't have anything to worry about. When? Ever! Why? I have a system. What's a system? I have faith in the one who is faithful. I know it's going to work because it already worked. Because in time, there's no such thing as the present. There's only the past and the future. As soon as I say now, it becomes what? Then, as soon as I say now, it becomes that. In, in the realm of time, there's no such, the present cannot exist in the realm of time. But guess what? In the realm of eternity, the past or the future doesn't exist. There's only the present. Eternity is the forever now. That's why God is the I am that I am and not the I was that I was or the I will be that I will be. <laughs> it's a system. That's why he knows the end from the beginning because the end is the beginning and the beginning is the end. (laughs) And all of it is right now. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. It's done. You say, Myron, what do you mean it's done? We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I don't have to wonder how it's going to turn out. It's already turned out that way. Done, finished, completed. I read the last chapter. We've already won. Now. Now. If I can understand the system and I can ask God for faith, nothing wavering. Why don't I want anything to waver? Because he that wavereth, watch this, this is what it says now. This is what it says. Let, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and is tossed. Now I want you to notice that the waves are driven with the wind. The doubt is created by the false doctrine. What is a false? It's a teaching that you believe that's not true. That's what the word doctrine means, teaching, right? So the waves create, the winds create the waves of doubt. 
The winds of false doctrine create the waves of false doubt. Why do I call it false doubt? Because if you have doubt, you're not trusting the system. I'm not talking about the United States of America system. I'm not talking about governmental system. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the kingdom system. Okay. <laughs> so then it says, but let him ask in faith. In what? Faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like, is, is, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind in his toss. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. What man? The double-minded man. The one that has faith mixed with doubt. You must learn to abandon doubt because you trust the system of the one who cannot lie. So many people drive the vehicle of their experience of life they drive their vehicle of the, the vehicle of their experience down the highway of life with one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. And what we have to learn to do based on the system, we have to learn how to accelerate into the curves. I can't see around the corner, but he can because he's already there. It says, I, I love this. It says, it says, let not him. Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind in his toss. Let not that man think that he shall receive what? Empty thing of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable. Hey, hey, in all his ways. I need to be single-minded. I need to be single-minded. I've got to learn to be single-minded. And once I learn to be single-minded, then I've got to practice being single-minded. Then I've got to discipline myself to be single-minded. Why? Because circumstances are going to arise that are going to cause me to be tempted to doubt. And when that circumstances arise, I need to learn how to look at it and say, thank you for sharing. But this chapter's already done and I already won. Peace out, Cub Scouts. Why are you talking to me? Why, why are you talking to me? Why are you talking to me? Don't you know who I am? See, I'm a child of the king and the king, are, like he wrote the whole book. He knows the end from the beginning. I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about anything. Anybody who has any power at all to use against me, the only reason they have that power is because God gave it to them, and if they're going to use it against me, they're going to use it against me to their own peril as long as I'm yielded to the king. What, what kind of world would we live in if followers of Christ trusted the system? What system? The system of a God who cannot lie. The double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. Stop mixing doubt in with your faith. I don't ever work on anything and worry if it's going to work. I already know it's going to work. So you're going to work for me, it's going to work on me, but it's going to work. And if it don't work for me and it works on me, I'm cool. Because now that means the next thing I'm going to work on is going to work for me because the last thing worked on me. And see what happens, most people get in a situation, they're working on something, the thing they're working on doesn't work for them, they think, well, it doesn't work, and then they start over and they lose all the momentum they had when they got started. <laughs> like, my prayer, I, I, would, I would love for God's people to wake up one day and realize who we are based on whose we are. We'd stop sticking our toe in the water, and we'd dive in the deep end head first. When Jesus, when, and, 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 um, John chapter 9, when, <laughs> when Jesus saw the blind man who couldn't see him, and he said, he went over to the man, and the, and the disciples asked him, who did send this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents that he was born blind, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So the man, here's what Jesus said, the man, the man is not suffering his condition because of anything he has done or his parents are done. The reason he 
has suffered this blindness is so I could come and do this miracle. Some of the trouble, some of the trials that we go through in our lives are just God making room in our life for a miracle. That's all it is. And here's what it says. So, so, so Jesus, Jesus said, he says to the disciples, now, you gotta understand, this is, this is so like religion, right? The disciples said, who did send this man or his parents that he was born blind? The man wasn't deaf, he was blind. They talking about his mama and his daddy right in front of him like he ain't even there just because he can't see. <laughs> he ain't deaf, y'all. And the religious leaders got it wrong. And Jesus said, neither one. But I love it when Jesus upsets the religious apple carts. Neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God might be manifest in him. And then it says, and then he spat on the ground. <sighs> Can you imagine being in a sermon when a preacher just spits on the ground? But it, it got worse. He got down on the ground and started pl- making clay of the spittle. Can y'all see their faces? In the Hebrew culture, according to the Old Testament, you, sp- you touch spit, somebody spits on you, you're unclean until the evening. Jesus spits on the ground, gets down on the ground. Now he's taking dirt, which is dirty, and spit, which is dirty, and he's they're like, oh, what's he doing? Oh. Right? I can see him cringing right now. Then, as if that ain't bad enough, he gets up. Like, what? Don't try to act like you'd be acting all normal if you were there. You wouldn't be, you'd be doing the same thing. You'd be like, oh, oh did y'all see what he did? Oh, he spit on the ground. Then he the fingers and then put it on the man. Ah. Nobody would be going home that day talking about preach the show, preach the day. No, that ain't what they're going to be saying. <laughs> And then he told the man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The word Siloam means sent. Well, I've done some research on the pool of Siloam. It's really interesting to see, like, the water systems in Israel are mind-blowing, like crazy mind-blowing. Anyway, he says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam in its deepest end was 70 feet deep. You're telling a blind man to go to a place He may or may not have ever been. And when he gets there, he won't even know he's there. Jesus didn't say, he didn't tell him how to get there. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. You know why? Because when we have an assignment, we are to fulfill the assignment and figure out the details on the way. Come on in. And figure out the details on the way. Stop worrying about, oh, but, but I don't want to get started until I know how to go. I don't even know where the pool of Siloam is. I'm, I'm going to head that way as soon as I get me a map, get it programmed. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And then he tells this man to get in the pool of Siloam and wash. What? What? You're telling a blind man to get in a 70-foot deep pool to wash spit clay off his eyes. Hmm, that's interesting. But the man did it. He went, here's what it says. He went and washed and came seeing. (laughs) He went blind, but he came seeing. Nothing Yeshua told that man to do was easy. But he did it anyway. And so what we've got to do is we've got to learn to trust the system like that. With no double-mindedness. One of the reasons, one of the reasons some of y'all are struggling in business because you're too incongruent. You're like, well, yeah, if this works, I hope it works. Well, if it works, well, maybe if it don't, I'll just go back and get another, I'll just go back and get another job. Well, maybe I can get, and you're, you're always making contingency plans and continuing to play small because you don't understand how big the God is that we serve. Don't be incongruent. Be single-minded, not double-minded. Single-mindedness of purpose. Huh. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I shouldn't be double-minded. What kind of mind should I have? I think it tells us in Philippians chapter 2. And I think it's verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So he knew what his purpose was. He knew his, he understood his identity. But watch this. Took, um, he was made, um, 
that's my being you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation. He wasn't concerned with what people thought about him. One of the reasons people are double-minded is because they are too busy trying to prove to somebody that they, that they don't really need validation from, but they feel like they need validation from, that they are who they say they are. Like, lose your need to prove something to anybody. And then it says, um, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Oh, maybe that's why we need people to think something about us, because we have all of this pride that we need other people to believe X, Y, Z about us. You know what? Your life is going to get a lot better when you have nothing to hide, nothing to lose, and nothing to prove, and nothing to gain. You have nothing to hide because you're walking in uprightness of heart you know, like you, between you and God. You got nothing to hide. You got nothing to prove because you know who you are based on who you are. You got nothing to lose because you realize it all belongs to him anyway. And you got nothing to gain because, like he said to Abram in Genesis chapter 15, fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. God is your provision and your protection. Like, I got nothing to lose. You can't lose with the stuff I use. Why? It's, we've already won. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Don't be double-minded. Get congruent. If, if, if you understand by the grace of God that the word of God shows you that you need to have a business and you need to be about that business because the dream cometh through a multitude of business, study, <laughs> and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, working with your hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may have lack of nothing. If you understand that and you walk in that, uh, I think you're going to be blown away when you do this one thing. I'm going to end it on this. When you only give energy to outcomes you desire and you learn to act as if the only thing that's impossible for you is that something would be impossible for you. Be single-minded. Hopefully this video helps you um, make sure you like it, you comment on it, you subscribe to it, you send it to all your friends, you smash the notification bell, and all the other YouTube stuff you do on YouTube, do that. And we'll see you next time. Peace out, Cub Scouts.